Greetings and salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, Judo Dave Roman. My intro music has changed. I decided to change the intro music because I did not want to break any copyright laws, and I did not want to anger a 75-year-old disco king. I am the king! Um, so... I am in the process of getting permission to use Carl Douglas's Kung Fu Fighting Song as an intro. I've had to reach out to their record company or, or his representatives. And I'm sure I won't hear back for the next uh, year. But in the event that they do reach out and they let me know that it's okay to use their song or if I have to pay a, a, a small fee, um, I'll find out. It's probably not going to be that cheap. And I'll probably have to use copyright free music from here on out. The song that I use for this intro is a song called Blade by Kinetic. And I found this song on a YouTube page called Copyright Free EDM. That is not a sponsor. I thought it would be proper to reference that page to let everybody know where I found this song. Feel free to go on that page if you'd like to download any of the copyright free music that they have. I'm very happy to be back with you all. And I've had a tremendous amount of response to this podcast. I'm very surprised and very flattered. I want to give a special shout out to all you freaks in Reddit land. You know who you are. You can't hide from me. No, I'm just kidding. I am very grateful for the response on social media, through email, uh, most particularly through Reddit. Some of my friends, some of my family. My wife hasn't listened to the podcast yet, but uh, I'll get her. I'll get her to listen one time when she's at work, and uh, I'm sure she'll uh, find this podcast hideous like the rest of you. But that's okay, because from what I can tell, there aren't many judo podcasts out there, and this seems to be the only dedicated judo podcast. So. In the last episode, I said I'm not the first and I won't be the last. Well, maybe I am the first judo dedicated podcast. Somebody wants to debate me on that, go right ahead. But I'm going to wear that crown. I'm going to wear that crown proudly. Today is December 18th, 2016. We're down to one week for Christmas shopping. I am almost done. In my last episode, I did not have everything that I needed to buy. And now I'm down to the last bits of things I need to get, uh, mostly for my kids. And um, I'm looking forward to Christmas next week. I will likely not do a Christmas podcast because I'll want to spend time with family. But I'm back today to talk about judo, to talk about things related to judo, and anything else I feel like talking about. I would like to tell you all about my weekend. Last night, I watched Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. And let me tell you, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it was fantastic. It was better than I could have hoped. And for all the reviewers saying out there that it's as good or better than The Empire Strikes Back, I would have to agree with that. Again, I'm not going to spoil it, but the movie was fantastic. It was... It was so good that this is going to be the first movie, most likely, it's going to be the first movie that I go back to pay and see again. I know there's a lot of people out there that, you know, when it comes to certain franchises like Lord of the Rings or anything Star Wars related when it comes out or or some of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies that come out, that a lot of people pay to see those movies two or three times. For me, I'm one of those guys that, We'll see a movie once and then wait for the Blu-ray, but not this time. I know I'm going to go back and see it at least once more and because it was, it was just that good. And it was one of those movies that almost made me tear up at the end. Almost. I've never teared up through a movie except for one that was Schindler's, Schindler's List. That's the only movie that ever made me cry. Uh, there's been some movies out there that have brought me almost to tears and you know I keep it in the back of my mind to keep it together and I I fight through that and I do 
but Star Wars last night, Rogue One was just was was just phenomenal. And it it, it wonderfully ties into a new hope. And I, I read a reviewer state that it makes the new hope better or it makes a new hope better as a movie. And I would have to agree with that after watching Rogue One. So I would highly recommend you guys go out, spend the $10, $12 to take a look at Rogue One. You will not be disappointed unless you hate Star Wars and you'll be extremely disappointed. But I've never met a person who sits there and says, I hate Star Wars. So if you're like me, which chances are, if you're listening to this, you're kind of sort of like me. I highly suggest you go watch Rogue One. As for the rest of my weekend, it's been so far so good. Friday night, I had another judo practice. It was a light night because it was promotion time. Well, we're moving on now. We're moving on now. Um, so I'd like to talk about that. I'd like to talk about my opinions on promotions and what they meant to me and what they mean to me today. There's some differences in how I used to feel about promotions compared to today. But Friday night was a great opportunity for certain students at my club to get promoted. A lot of the kids got promoted. I think there was only a few that did not get promoted simply because they have a relatively high junior rank and we just can't promote them to the next rank so soon. It would not be a uh, proper protocol. They don't have the minimum requirements. And chances are, since these promotions through the club sensei, sensei are done through USA Judo, they would raise some suspicions or eyebrows. And, and we want to do things by the books at our club. Yeah, um, Which, when I started going to this club, I was surprised to find out that he bothers to sensei. register the junior ranks. Say what? I have never been to a club that registers the junior ranks unless that junior is being promoted to EQ. And I think that makes sense. But um, I've never, I've never seen a white belt get going to a yellow belt, get registered formally by the USA Judo Association. So it's a little bit different here, but that's a good thing. I think um, you have a, a long-standing record. If the, any of these kids continue through judo to go to Shodan and, and promotions beyond Shodan, uh, it's probably good to have a long record of your time in judo and your contributions to judo and your accomplishments in judo. So we had a really good time. I would think uh, out of the 12 students or so that were there, I think eight of them got promoted. The only two that didn't get promoted were two higher ranking students and the two lowest ranking students, which just happens to be my two sons. And that's not a knock on them at all. They just are too new to judo to deserve any sort of promotion. But I think soon enough, they'll be good enough to be promoted to yellow belt. A lot of their break falls, they're still doing pretty good. Um, their movements in Rondori is, are, are still good. I'm very impressed and very proud of their progress. And I'm honestly, I'm not trying to be biased here. Um, I, I think they could be yellow belts in three months with uh, dedicated practice and, and continued practice. And, um, you know, again, that's not a bias. I just, uh, I think they're coming along pretty well. You know, I think promotions are good for kids. Um, and I think it's important that promotions are done when a student deserves them. Now, I'm sure some of you with that statement are saying, well, of course it's when they deserve them. But sometimes some clubs have promotion days where they only promote once a year or they only promote once every six months or they only have a, pr and I'm talking about not promoting everybody. I'm talking about promotion ceremonies. I, on the other hand, that is not how I was promoted when I came up through the ranks. I was always promoted when the sensei, sensei. thought I deserved it. 
and I worked very hard for all of these promotions. Um, I probably, in my opinion, in hindsight, was promoted too quickly. Um, because I was promoted from white belt to yellow belt in two months. And then, um, then I was promoted from yellow belt to green belt, which is Yonkyu. I was promoted six months later. And then two months after that, I was promoted to Sankyu. And I know that sounds really fast, but look, you know, I didn't promote myself. I didn't uh, lobby for promotions. I didn't politic for promotions. I was just somebody who practiced as much as possible. And I put in a lot of hours on the mat. And I put in a lot of practice at home because, you know, especially in that first year, it's it's not very common for people to get promoted to Sankyu, which is in 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 the United States on the USA Judo Sankyu, they they have you wear brown belts. I know in other countries that might be uh, Sankyu might be a blue belt or a green belt, but in the United States, Sankyu, Nikyu, and EQ all wear brown belts. So I worked pretty hard to get um that promotion and it was very rewarding for me because in my own professional career i felt that i had been passed over for promotions that i felt i deserved uh i knew i deserved them um but sometimes like in like in anything politics can get in the way so i felt when i joined judo that this was something that I wanted to take very seriously. I knew it was for me. I just, it was one of those things I knew deep down in in, that judo was inherently for me. And it was something that I could excel and be good at. And I went very focused into it. And I worked very, very hard to, um, to be recognized. I, I remember the very first, um, Shi'ai that I, not tournament just just Shi'ai because our club had had uh, Shi'ai all the time. I'm not and I'm not talking about Rondori. We actually had you know referees. People would be a referee in the club, and we would get up and we would fight each other. We'd fight anybody. In the very in my second class, I was thrown into the Shi'ai. It was kind of crazy in hindsight, and I threw this other guy for Ipon with Uchimata. And at the time, I didn't know what Uchimata was. It just grabbed the guy up at the top and turned around and threw my leg up in between you know his legs and he went over and landed on his back and that was uh the very first experience with Shi'ai and then on my third class I was paired up with some brown belt and and I beat him so I got the attention of a lot of the instructors right away out of your sensei um because of these mock Shi'ais, I guess you want to call it, because it's not official. Nobody got medals or anything. It was Shi'ai. Um, however you want to define Shi'ai, that's exactly what it was. So I kept, I would fight anybody. And there would be times that I would lose. But a lot of times when I would lose, I put up a good fight, a really good fight. And there were times that I would win. Um I'm just a club level showed on, um, you know, I'm nothing special, uh, recreational player. It's always, it's how it's always been, but I still took my effort and my dedication to judo very seriously, even as a recreational player. So back to what I was saying about promotions, I think being focused and caring about promotions is important. In hindsight, I wish I didn't make it as important because my mindset at the time was more about the destination rather than the journey. Now that I've been a Shodan for a long time and I've been a black belt longer than I haven't been a black belt, my experience in Judo is far more about the journey instead of the destination. So wherever my promotions and my experiences lead me, they will always be important and I'll always cherish all of those experiences. But 
my focus will not be on a particular destination. And when I was coming up through the Q ranks, that destination was black belt. And that's understandable because I'm certain just about every Q rank who loves judo as much as I do has that goal in mind. Even the guys who have been an EQ or a NEQ or a brown belt for years and years and years, sometimes I come across those type of guys and they'll say something like, oh, the promotion doesn't really matter to me. I, I say baloney. I think it matters to you even a little bit. At the same time, I can respect their point of view that perhaps they have come to realize the same thing that I've come to realize is that it's far more important to enjoy the journey than be concerned about the destination. Now that I've been a Shodan longer than I haven't been a Shodan, um, a promotion to Nidan is not as critical to me as it once was. And the next promotions are not as critical to me as it once was. Whether that's at whether I ever get promoted to Sandan or, or Yodan, I don't, I don't ever foresee being promoted to Yodan. Um, I would have to be a lot more dedicated. I would need a lot more time than I have to be dedicated to improve, to be at that level. And I don't, I don't foresee getting a Sandan anytime soon, even if I get promoted to Nidan in the next year or two. Um, but my next promotion would be Nidan, and that is an important promotion to me. Um, and I would like to, over the next year, be dedicated to earn that promotion. Because I feel that if I am ever to be somebody who can teach... I need the ability to be able to promote the Shodan. So in terms of the immediate future for myself and Judo, which the immediate future for me looks more like five years, Nidan is important to me because it's important to me to be able to promote somebody to Shodan if I were to ever have my own club or if there was ever a situation where somebody needed that kind of promotion and look i don't know the um, the the protocol when it comes to promotions to don ranks um i know there are requirements to be met in terms of technical requirements i know you need a certain amount of points i know you need to be registered with the judo association but beyond that i don't know what is really needed um and you know along those lines I got promoted to Shodan um, in four years. The promotions happened very quickly to me. And again, like I've said before, I never asked for the promotions. I never lobbied for them. Um, I know my judo coach had lobbied for me to get Shodan. Um, and I was promoted to Shodan in, if I recall correctly, October of 2010 and I've been a prom uh, I've been a showdown since then I've not had another promotion because I've I've bounced around from club to club and you know that's what happens when you don't stick to one club or you jump around from different club to different club it's good for your overall judo development but you end up in a situation where either people can't promote you or they're reluctant to promote you to the next rank because you just haven't been dedicated in their particular club. So, so for all you Q ranks that may be listening to this podcast, if the promotions matter to you, that's a good thing. Um, I'm not going to be one of these guys who has his black belt and be like, oh, promotions don't really matter. They do matter. And they should matter to you. If you're not getting promoted in a way that you think you should be promoted, you should find out why. You should find out what you need to work on. I think it's important to let your sensei know your sensei. or your coach know, hey, what do I need to do to get promoted to the next rank? What do you need to see from me to get promoted to the next rank? Because I think when you do that, it shows the... Sensei, your sensei or your coach that you care about it and you should care 
especially when you're younger, you want to have a better understanding of what you need to develop on and what throws you need to develop and what your sensei or coach needs to see from you. For the adults out there, it's also important, but sometimes with adults, they can have ulterior motives. I never, ever ask for a promotion. I never ask these questions of my own instructors. I never, ever angled for any single promotion. They just came my way. Um, And I would suggest for the adults that you need to be consistent. You need to work hard. And you need to work at home. If you're not getting something right, your footwork, your timing... I would strongly suggest working at home. And one of the things that helped me improve my own judo, as strange as it's going to sound, is I call it shadow rondori. It's like shadow boxing, except you're doing rondori against an imaginary opponent. And this is an exercise that my judo coach, my longtime judo coach and friend, taught me to do. And at first, it seemed really, really silly. Um, But it exposed certain things on what I do or what I was doing on the mats that helped me improve and helped me correct. So, for example, um, you know, if I'm doing a combination like, like, Kosoto Gari to Kouchi Gari to trying to get an Ippon Sayanagi. Well, way back in the day, when I was doing that combination against an imaginary opponent, when I would go in for the Ippon Sayanagi, I was ending up on my heels because my momentum was carrying me backwards. And it showed me that I was off balance when it came to that attack. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, well, you're you're going against an imaginary opponent with zero resistance. So you're going to fall backwards naturally if you're attacking hard. Well, not necessarily. I really found out that my balance was was off. And as soon as I started correcting that, I started seeing improvements. Um, even for, for some of my rear throws, I would notice things about my balance that were exposing holes in my game. Now, I'm not saying that this is something you should do all the time or that Shadow Rondori is the silver bullet that's going to help you improve your judo overnight, but I think there's some merit to adding a tool in order to improve on your Rondori and improve your judo overall. It's simply a tool. Shadow box, I mean, people who box do shadow boxing as a tool. I think all of you have seen movies that have to do with boxing. Um, if not, I would suggest that you start with Rocky. But boxers. And people who compete in different sports, they do different things to help them improve overall. And some of those things may seem silly at first, but but if you view it that it's just another tool, I think the silliness aspect of it will ease on your mind and you can approach that type of training with a dedicated mindset. So... When I was at home practicing, I would I had bands to use for practice, so I would, you know, do uchikomi with the bands and I would video record myself doing uchikomi. I would video record myself doing shadow rondori, and I would also video myself doing regular rondori. I still have those videos out on YouTube if anybody's interested. Uh actually speaking of which, I need I'm going to create a new YouTube channel. I'll upload some of those videos. They're really old. They're like eight or nine years old. But um, it's nice for me to go back and see, you know, not only myself 10 years younger, but to see how far I've come 
and see where I was in my development and compare that to now. And I would suggest that if you all want to improve and you all want to get promoted, that you do those things. So if your sensei says, you know, maybe your Tayatoshi is not very good, you can take a look at yourself doing Tayatoshi, doing the Uchikomi and doing the Shadow Randori and, and doing regular Randori or just, or just Nagekomi. You can take a look at your Tayatoshi and see, huh, um, that doesn't look quite right. Or if you need to, you take a look at a video of a Tayatoshi master, like somebody like the great Neil Adams. Um, you can take a look at his Tayatoshi and then take a look at your Tayatoshi and see where the differences are. Now, look, Neil Adams is, is one of the all time greats and nobody's Tayatoshi is going to look like Neil Adams, but it can look sort of like Neil Adams. And that's something that I did uh, with my own development with certain throws. Tayatoshi was one of them. I do a Tayatoshi style that is similar to Neil Adams um, simply because I had my judo coach learn Tayatoshi from Neil Adams and he taught that to me. So, and between my coach getting the Tayatoshi Masterclass book and looking at uh, countless hours of video, I that's how, what I did in order to improve on my judo. I did the same thing with Sayanagi. I did the same thing with Uchimada. So with all that being said, again, I like to go back to the promotions. They're very important. They should matter to you. If you feel like you're getting slighted, you should find out why. The other day while I was work, I walked into the main lobby and on a table, I saw a stack of newspapers from our local, um, really the only game in town when it comes to newspapers, it's, it's the Tampa Bay Times. But the Tampa Bay Times has a free paper they put out there that looks like the New York Post. So I decided to pick it up. And since the New York or, or since the Tampa Bay Times paper here, it's called a TBT. They follow a format like the New York Post. I always go to the back page because the back page is the sports section and the back page is the cover of the sports section. And normally I get the paper to look at the back page to see if the Tampa Bay Lightning won or lost or to see if the Buccaneers won or lost or to see if there's a new article about a particular Buccaneers player that I'm interested in. But this weekend, uh, it wasn't this weekend, it was Thursday, I grabbed the paper and lo and behold, I see Kayla Harrison on the back. So my immediate thought was, well, the Lightning didn't play last night. But my second immediate thought was, this is fantastic. Judo is getting exposure in the local paper. So I turned the pages in reverse because I have to go you know, backwards to forwards and and I'm and I just had to turn a couple pages and the headline of this article written by um, Victor Mather of the New York Times. So I guess what the TBD did in this case was get an article from another newspaper source and then reprinted it with their permission of I'm sure. So the headline says emulate Rousey and quote unquote, kill it in the cage. It starts off. Only one American has ever won an Olympic gold medal in judo, Kayla Harrison. And she has won two in London, 2012 and in Rio this year. Yet despite her achievements, Harrison is the country's second most famous judoka. Number one is her former roommate, Ronda Rousey who won a bronze medal in 2008 and went on to fame, fortune, and magazine covers as the highest profile fighter in mixed martial arts. Now Harrison, 26, plans to follow her into the cage in the World Series of Fighting Organization. The article goes on to quote Harrison, If you had peeked through our apartment window in 2007 and said, one of you is going to win two Olympic gold medals and one is going to become a sports icon. We would both have said, what are you talking about? 
We're eating ramen noodles and barely getting by. Now, this is me. This is not the article. This is really interesting to me because, you know, I'm not going to read the entire article, but if you want to read it, you can look up Victor Mather from the New York Times and read the entire article. It talks about how Ronda Rousey paved the way for Kayla Harrison. It talks about um, her future in the sport with the World Series of Fighting, looking to bring some legitimacy to the sport. And the article just continues to talk about, you know, who dream opponents might be for her. She specific, specifically talks about Cyborg, um, talks about uh, doing everything. This is an interesting comment. She says, I've been doing the same thing in judo for 20 years. Everything I do in judo, I learned in the first six months of the Pedros or with the Pedros. Now I'm learning new things. I'm learning heel hooks and knee bars and a jab and a hook, uppercuts. It's invigorating. Um what's interesting to me about this article is not so much about Harrison going to mixed martial arts is the, the short little blurb that I read just a few minutes ago about eating ramen noodles and barely getting by. You know, there has been a lot of criticism of USA judo and their inability to support their athletes properly. Now there's a lady on Facebook um, I can't, I can't quite remember her name. I believe her first name is Lynn. She has been on a crusade against USA judo and their mismanagement of funds. Um, but it's really interesting. And you know, one day I would love to interview her. Maybe she'll be my first or second interview. If I ever do interviews on this podcast, which I'd love to do, she might be my first or second interview. Um, It's no surprise to me that Kayla Harrison is going the route of mixed martial arts. And I'm okay with that. You know, there's a lot of old time judo people who feel that she should continue to give back to the community, that she should not pursue the money and should not pursue the fame. Um, but I completely disagree with that. You know, these judo athletes are not supported by USA Judo in the way that they should be. And I don't doubt for one second that they were, for for a majority of their time, eating ramen noodles and barely getting by. And I think there's something wrong with that. Especially when there is enough money being pumped into USA Judo to do a better job supporting these athletes. I mean, these ladies, these men who are true competitors, who truly travel around and depend on parent uh, money from their parents, their family, their friends, their sponsors. I mean, they're really getting by, barely getting by. And, and they have given up their lives to pursue an Olympic gold medal. And most of them don't make it. I mean, look, I'm not going to name names from USA Judo, but there have been some athletes that were Olympic hopefuls and they didn't come close and they gave up a lot to not get very close to getting a, a medal. And it's really a shame because not only did they miss out on that dream of getting an Olympic medal, but here they are in the middle of their 20s. And it wouldn't surprise me if they're not in a position to be able to support themselves financially for the rest of their lives. Now, you know, Harrison is 26 and she probably does not have all that much money. Um, certainly she can't do anything outside of judo. Um, so this is the natural path for her. I mean, what is she going to do? Open up her own club, her own judo club and try and teach judo? I mean, she's not so well known in a broader sense that parents are going to bring their kids to her who don't know anything about judo. Like if Kayla Harrison were to open a club in Tampa, yeah, you would have a lot of local judo people joining, but, but at the end of the day, you need new students. And, you know, when it comes to parents... 
it's it all comes down to affordability. Now, somebody like Kayla Harrison could probably charge $150, $200 a month in membership dues. And there are people locally who would pay it. I mean, I, I couldn't pay it. There's, there's no way I would, I, I would shell out that kind of money. I mean, I might stop by every once in a while, but I couldn't pay that monthly. And I have a pretty good career. Uh, but there's a lot of parents who, who really just make a, 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 a middle income salary. And you're asking a lot. Um, so I don't think Kayla Harrison could be very successful opening her own club and getting the kind of demand, um, and or getting the kind of attendance needed to carve out a nice, comfortable living for herself. So mixed martial arts makes the most sense because she needs to make money somehow. Uh, her Olympic career is over. I, I mean, at 26 years old, I had my first son. I was married. I already was making... Well, I won't get into how much I was making, but for a 26 year old, I was doing very well for myself, but you know, there were, there were things that I had to give up. I wasn't doing judo at the time, but, but I was somebody who liked to travel. I love skiing and there was a lot of things I had to give up, um, in order to have a family and a career. And, you know, we only have so much time in life to, do the things that we want to do. And I would think for somebody like an Olympian, it must be hard to prioritize those things because, you know, one day their physical gifts and their physical skills and their strength and their speed, it's all going to fade away. Um, you know, father time is undefeated in that regard. We all get older and we all get slower. And, I would think it would be, I would think it would be hard to settle down. Maybe not. I suppose maybe if Kayla manages to make millions of dollars, settling down will be a pretty easy job. But, but all, all I'm really saying here is that it must be very hard to be an Olympic hopeful and to be a full-time judo athlete when you don't have the support out there. When it comes to professional sports like like the NBA or the NFL, you're given contracts, you're given endorsements if you're really good. I mean, somebody, if Kayla Harrison was a basketball player and she had the kind of world-level talent in basketball as she does in judo, her grandchildren's grandchildren would be set for life if she did things right financially. But it's a tough dream to follow. And, you know, I don't know how many people truly are cut out for that kind of sacrifice. I just reading this article just really hammered it home for me how much these athletes sacrifice. And it's really, um, I, I, I respect them for it. It's, it's a tough sacrifice. Um, now Grant, look, uh, the people who serve in our military truly sacrifice, and and many of them sacrificed their own lives um, in order for me to have the freedom to speak my mind against the government or to give you my opinions on this podcast or to have all the freedoms that I have in this great country of ours. That's a real sacrifice. Now, I, I don't want to get the two mixed up, but but I certainly have to acknowledge that these judo athletes, especially in the United States, sacrifice for a lot to get very little in return. Um, and it shouldn't be that way. And I'm sure some of you have heard the kind of allegations against USA Judo and the way that they mismanaged their funds. Um, you know, if I had it my way, if I had my own club, I would not register it through USA Judo. I, I, I would probably find another way. Um, yeah, I just, I just don't know. There's just no way I, I would um, choose to send my money there if I had my own club. But, you know, if I want to get promoted and if other people want to get promoted, you have to be a part of USA Judo, apparently. So now I know there's, there's USJA and there's the USJI, um, but they still work in conjunction with USA Judo. And I suppose if you never wanted to do a USA Judo sanctioned event, 
You could go break off in, into your own federation. There are independent federations out there that want nothing to do with USA Judo. Um, but then all of a sudden, people look at them and they say, you're not a legitimate rank holder in that organization. And that's for another topic. Done with it. Yes, get over it. Yeah! As always, I am very grateful for giving me the opportunity to come into your headsets, into your car speakers, giving me a listen. If you have an opportunity or have an option to give this podcast a thumbs up or to leave a comment, please feel free to do so, even if it's a negative comment. And as always, you can reach out to me on Twitter at La Vida Judoka. You can also hit me up on email with judo.dave.roman at gmail.com. And I've made my presence known on Reddit. For all you freaks out there on Reddit, my username is D underscore Rome, R-O-M-E. Feel free to look me up on there. And once I figure out my YouTube channel, I'll in my next podcast, I'll let you know what that YouTube channel is going to be. So with that, you all have a good rest of the weekend. And if you're somewhere else in the world, uh, a great Monday. Stay safe out there. Train hard. I'm out. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Open. Open.